Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. Jack stood on the old footbridge, staring gloomily into the dark water. Above his head was the bustling freeway, a brand new overpass connecting the historic part of town to the beltway. It had only recently been rebuilt. Now it loomed over a small ancient bridge, like a colossus over a Lilliputian who had come from fear. There he was, Jack seemed to himself just as small and insignificant. How long had it been since time and his meteoric rise? Huge financial successes. How long had he counted himself among the strong of this world, having achieved everything he could wish for? How naive was he then? The country boy, who had joined a gang of robbers after school, had made his first fortune in the criminal protection of small businesses. Yes, his mother was right when she tearfully tried to talk her only son out of this unrighteous life. Jack, son, come to your senses before it's too late. I beg you, this life won't do you any good. Stop it, mother. He wrinkled his nose like a toothache. What do you want me to do? Go work as a tractor driver. For life, like my father. Well, why not? An honest life is always better. Aren't we living badly? Don't you and Cindy need anything? We had no palaces, no yachts, but we've been standing on our own two feet as long as my father was alive and the house and everything we have. Your father worked hard and didn't rob anybody. What about you, me? With Jack, didn't you think that kind of life wasn't good for me? No, to each his own, you know. I don't want to spend all my years in the country. I want to see the world and we're not rotting anybody. For your information, we just provide conflict resolution services, smirk Jack. Ah, is that what you call it now? Bitterly, the mother sighed. If your father were alive, that's enough. The boy cut her off abruptly. I've had enough of you and your lectures, father is father, that's it. I'm not him, you know, and I'm going to live my own life. I see she looked at him with pity and even sympathy, as if he were still an irrational child. He was furious, so he slammed the door and went out of the house. He didn't come back for a few days and spent the night at his new friend's house. Then he came home, packed his things, and left the house for good. At least that was what he thought at the time. During the years of his father's life, Jask's parents' house was indeed a full bowl. His father was strong and undrinkable, which was a rarity in rural areas. He spent all his life in his native village, working as a tractor driver and combined harvester. In general, he was always on the first name basis with any machinery. He even assembled the car with his own hands. He bought it for pennies, and in the opinion of an auto mechanic, it was not subject to restoration from an old wrecked jiggly body. Over time, the used motor of various parts, where, from whom he borrowed unnecessary, where he found, where he bargained cheaply. I worked hard for several years in my workshop, equipped in a garage, and then almost a new car turned out on the driving qualities and went it for mushrooms, and the city and the fairs, in the neighboring village, and everywhere in general. They lived very well by country standards, thanks to his father's healthy lifestyle, which he had inherited from his parents, baptized old believers. Jack still remembered his grandfather as a tall, leaning head-to-toe onion elder with a long white beard. As children before school, he and his sister sincerely believed that their grandfather was Santa Claus. Very striking was the portrait resemblance to the image of a fabulous grandfather, smiling from the Christmas cards. True, their grandfather was always strict, not very talkative, always busy with business, and only on weekends on Sundays, when he did not work and did not allow others. Yes, on big church holidays he allowed himself idleness and banter. So did his father, his uncle, and his father's five other sisters. All grew up under such care as serious and hard-working people. No one drank, no one left for the city for a better life. Now this family was the current backbone of the village, together with their own families, a friendly big family Blagovshinsky them, I think, on their strong shoulders carried both in the Soviet and perestroika years, the collective farm, 
and then the new Joint Stock Companies area, which replaced the old Reds area. Both the men and women of this family had worked the land from childhood, and all the mothers of the surrounding youth dreamed of becoming related to them. But Jack was the lousy sheep in that family. He was the sheep of the flock. Lord, day and night she prayed for her only son and cried all the time. I regretted her husband's early passing and her son, who's a bringing, being a widow, she had missed out on something important. And Jack, remembering his father, was invariably angry. His sudden death was a shock to the family. And Jack was a boy at the time, learning as he did the other circumstances of his father's death from then until this day, he asked himself one single question why. Why did he go there? Did he want it more than anyone else? Left them all orphans, but he could still live and live. Not one of them, though. He was the only one who was tortured by such a question. The circumstances of his father's death were truly tragic. One day, in a hot harvest country, he forgot the glasses in which he was reading in the evening in the sweeper. He settled down with the newspaper, and there were no glasses. Anybody else would have said no, but never mind. I'll get them tomorrow. But my father, always easy on the rise, immediately got ready and went to the combined for glasses. On his way back he saw, in the twilight, suspicious persons sneaking to the auto warehouse, where gasoline, spare parts, and many other useful things were kept. Frank immediately followed and witnessed a theft that had already taken place. The warehouse had been broken into, and the two intruders were already at work there, had left someone else's stuff parked next to his car, and those he had spotted in the dark coming out on the lookout, wandering around, and they had seen him too and arrived on the scene. How pacing the casual witness. Stay where you are. Frank met with a fearsome response. What on earth do you think you're doing? He was indignant, not accustomed to being left out. I told you to stay back, replied the talking Frank. I looked closely in the dusk and could not make out their faces. Besides, the men had their hats and cap pulled low over their faces, but he recognized the voice. John, was it you? Oh, shit, he confessed. The instigator of the theft got angry and raised his hunting rifle. For the last time, get out of here, Frank, and forget what you saw. Then I'll give you a good deal and you won't be left out in the cold. It's not someone else's, it's ours. To this joke of his chief, the rest of the men laughed merrily and rudely. It will not work out for you. John, put the gun down. Frank commanded, but the robbers were not about to part with their prey so easily. John's fellow villager fired a particularly hard shot to scare off an overzealous champion of justice. The bullet ricocheted off some iron and hit one of the thieves in the leg. He howled in pain and Frank, taking advantage of the general confusion, sprang up close to John and began to fight him, wrestling the weapon out of his hands. In the fight, John, he later claimed, accidentally pulled the trigger again. Frank went down without breathing. The shot went right through the heart. The investigation dragged on for months. All the perpetrators were jailed. All the loot was returned. Only Jack's father was never recovered. He had been his parents' benefactor since childhood. He took the loss very hard. He withdrew into himself, became moody, rude, started smoking at the same time. But he also ended up with a bad company. He never talked about his father since then. And he never talked about his family at all. In fact, in the circles where he was now, nobody cared about his past. Everyone in the group had a story to tell. They all had their own baggage and their own skeletons in the closet. Gradually his and his boy's criminal business grew into a network, reaching as far as the nearest town. There's more. Jack was spotted by birds of a higher flight and made an offer that was impossible to refuse. So he found himself in a city large and very far from his native home. Lost now in one of the countless villages, for the first few years things were going remarkably well for both Jack and their entire shady business, stretching its tentacles like a giant octopus into all areas of city life. No business of any significance escaped its common fate. It was controlled, milked in exchange, 
providing protection from countless and far more reckless gangster gangs. Soon Jack, a smart and observant guy, began to realize that his executives had the right connections in both the agencies and the government. He had his own people in the police department, the mayor's office, and everywhere else any problem was solved for dough. Everything depended on the amount of bribe, just like everybody else. I saved enough money. Jack opened his first legitimate project. He opted for a fast food joint, and he didn't lose. The network of fast food, which he purchased as a franchisee, began to develop rapidly, bringing good profits. The next step was filling stations not at the most passable points. Everything there was already occupied by more high-ranking owners. But on the highway adjoining the city, and the project paid off, eight years after the beginning of such an independent life, Jack became in the eyes of the common people the big businessman, having everything you could wish for several expensive cars, an apartment in the center, and another one on the waterfront. Another for a mistress country cottage with a large plot in a prestigious place servants to maintain it all in order and money. A lot of money. Money gave him freedom, independence, confidence in the future, a chance to see the world, in short, practically everything. He didn't have a family yet. He wasn't in much of a hurry to get one. He was fine as he was. Jack barely remembered his mother and sister, whom he had left to their fate years ago. Jack was in a dazzling smile. A young secretary whenever he came into his office, and the guards invariably took to his visor, smiling absent-mindedly if he was in a good mood. He would pass by, barely dignifying the guards with a glance, and Helen the secretary would affectionately pat her on the shoulder, or even playfully pat her just below the back. She wouldn't have minded if the handsome rich boss had allowed himself more, but right now Jack was infatuated with his current fling. So Helen had nothing to catch for now, but she hadn't given up hope, always ready to oblige as the situation demanded. Hey, bro. One of his partners in the new business entered the office without warning. They'd grown out of the punk scene these days. It had been a long time since they had gone on raids to collect bribes from businessmen. Their own businesses were, of course, free of any kind of roof, but they regularly brought the due to their elders. And they, in turn, kept a piece for themselves and passed it on to the very top, where exactly that notorious big score was located. And who was he? Jack, like others at his level, did not know. Nor did he ask himself such a question. It was none of his business. Great. Jack stood up to meet his brother, walked over, hugged him, and shook his outstretched hand firmly. How's it going? Oh, it's all right. The guest lazily lounged in a leather armchair. The girl in your waiting room is fine. You'll use it. Give it to me. Jack waved his hand, indifferently. So sits not up to it. Well, well, good-naturedly laughed his colleague. And if I leave, take it, if you like it. Jack generously agreed. We'll find another one. All right, let him get us some coffee. He smirked, and we'll see. I came to see you about that. There's some big money to be made. We need to pool our money together. How much? Business-like, Jack asked, nodding. That was the order of the day, and he had long been accustomed to such visits, but when he heard the amount he whistled, but it's a lot. I can't collect that much. Sell something. The guest advised indifferently. Daddy said I should. Yeah. Jack frowned slightly. But it won't be quick. What kind of project? Roads will be built in the city and in the region. You gotta win the tender, get the dough to the mayor's office. Then it'll pay for itself three times over. My colleague briefly outlined the situation. I see, Jack nodded. They drank coffee with expensive cognac. Then the guest went out to the reception to chat with Lenashka. And Jack wondered what he could sell quickly. It was not even a question of disobeying. It was the kind of business he had to do. Call his friend the realtor. Together, they came to the conclusion that the gas stations would go faster. With a heavy heart, Jack signed the necessary papers and mentally said goodbye to part of his business. Never mind, he consoled himself. It would pay off threefold later. Of course, this sacrifice had no effect on his daily life, 
but his income dropped many times over. After a couple of months, he even had to dip into the dollar reserve that Jack Berry had set aside for a rainy day. So how was the bidding going? He asked when we met. The same colleague who stopped by before the gas station sale. Yeah, totally screwed, he said in a nonchalant tone. The competitors have outbid us, and we're out of business, so our contributions won't pay off, Jack clarified, trying to sound just as indifferent. An unpleasant chill crawled up his spine. No luck, brother, he nodded. Not this time, Cest Levi. And he laughed, put in his head Cest Levi. Jack responded in a faltering voice. And you, the man smiled. That was it. There was nothing to cover for. There was no one to claim his rights. There were for the rights, and there were not. Goodbye, beloved child. A will have to somehow squeeze to reduce costs, something to sell, probably to buy again at least one or something else. What should he sell? Jack's thoughts ran to and fro, and there was an unpleasant pounding in his temples. After going through all the possible options, he finally settled on the most painless one from his point of view. Hello, sweetheart. When he entered the apartment where his mistress lived, he found her lying in a drunken bathtub. Oh dear. The girl rejoiced, making a welcoming mask. What are you doing at this time of day? I just got back from a fitness class. You won't believe it. My new trainer is the bomb. I swear on my poor legs, Jenna. He interrupted her before she could listen to any more of his idle chatter. I'm on a case. Yes, she daintily pulled her small and precise feet out of the cloud of foam. Well then, dial my business. And she herself laughed merrily with her own puns. No, and she didn't. Jack jerked his fiddle mouth in his face. At all. Let's talk a little later. Suddenly, he decided and started throwing off his clothes. That's right. Jenna smiled broadly. Later, when they were lying next to each other on the huge bed across from the wide open window overlooking the expanse of loggia, they were smoking. As if casually, he said to her, I had to get into some unforeseen expenses. My poor darling. She missed me enough. I pity the face, too. Pity how? Yes, agreed Jack, throwing the butt into the ashtray. Too bad. That's why we'll have to sell this apartment. What did Jenna resent about this sudden turn of events? Their sweet talk. Sell my apartment. Where do you expect me to live? But you've lived somewhere before. He shrugged his shoulders indifferently and reached for the pack lying next to him and took another drag. Wait, wait, wait. She jumped out of bed, and not in a joking way. Anxious Jenna threw her robe on and ran back and forth across the room. This is some kind of practical joke, right? It's like a louse test. Well, that's where you're wrong, honey. Am I smarter than you think? Of course I love you and everything, and you had absolutely no intention of selling my apartment. She blurted out the last words in desperation and stared at him confusedly absent-mindedly. Didn't you? No, baby, not like that. He shook his head softly. No, it isn't. This isn't a joke or a prank. I need money urgently. I will have to sell it. In addition, let me remind you that this apartment and the car you drive and everything else that is here is bought by me and registered in my name. And you're not my wife to make conditions. If we have money, we'll buy another one. That's all. And what am I to do? The girl's lips were trembling, and there were tears in her eyes. Where to go? You can stay at my farm for now, he said, or come home for a while. How do you like it? Look, you're really something. Jenna was indignant. Where do you think you're going? Back to my mother's crib. The one I saw in a coffin and white slippers. Or the dorm where me and the girls used to live before I met you. And the Dakas are in the middle of nowhere. A lot of people go from out of town. Jack the silly Jack said calmly, If I have to do it, I have to do it. Don't yell like that. You ain't the first, you ain't the last. You'd better thank me for not putting you on the street at all. I know exactly what's going on. Oh, you know, Jenna, you realize that you can screw over an honest girl and make promises first to get her used to the good life. 
and then dump her like that. As far as I'm concerned, you're not going to pay me anymore, either. I will, Jack promised. He frowned squeamishly. He liked the spectacle less and less. But there was nowhere to go. He did feel a certain responsibility for Jenna. But he had to admit, she was overreacting now. And the anger going to his head along with every angry word she said was already suffocating him and keeping him from thinking soberly. I'll only be less until I get things sorted out, he repeated. Now that's really out of line, Jenna shouted. What do you think I am? A pauper. I didn't find myself in a dumpster. I didn't find myself in a dumpster when I agreed to have sex with you. I've made it clear what I'm signing up for. You give me a life of security. I give you love and affection. Isn't that right? And you took advantage of my innocence. How'd you get your innocence kicked in the ass? Laughed in her face. Jack, stop telling me fairy tales. You'd think. I don't know how much innocence you were ashamed of. And that's enough bullshit. Like I said, that's the way it's gonna be. Your job is to keep quiet and listen to the woman. And if there's something you're not comfortable with, go home. Go home. To mommy's wing. At this point, he decided to end the pointless discussion. He gathered his things leisurely, got dressed in the big luxurious bathroom, and left. No more, not listening to the pathetic shrieks. The next day, I called the realtor again, handed over the paperwork for the apartment, wrote out a power of attorney, and the proceeds from the sale should have been enough to buy out some remote gas station. It wasn't much, but it was a relief. I had to make up for it somehow. Jack, your whore surprised us here. Soon he got a call from a realtor who'd been in all kinds of trouble. What else? Jack responded irritated, busy at this time with the contribution of his manager. Come and see for yourself, the woman said ominously, and hung up. Holy shit. All he could utter when he arrived at the place, clean and neat. The apartment, luxuriously done the day before, was now a rather pitiful sight. It was filmed and seen. There was everything that could be taken away. There were no plumbing fixtures in the units, not a word at all. There were only shiny black holes instead of the Italian toilet, expensive jacuzzi tubs, and bidets. Lamps, sconces, chandeliers were missing. The furniture was gone, curtains, and other things. Textiles have removed even the blinds are not too lazy to take away either appliances or built-in kitchen was not at all. What can I say? There was not even an interroom door. It's like the roaring manatees. The realtor raised her eyebrows with a nervous grin. Back then, people really took the door off and took their stoves away. But here, of course, she did her best. She had it so bad for Jack. Nothing. He gritted his teeth, trying to control himself. Anyway, the realtor folded her arms across her chest. It is no longer possible to sell it as a luxury home. No one will give such a price for this trash. I understand. He barely made it out. We'll sell it. The woman summed it up. My commission stays as agreed. There's a lot of work to be done here. I agree. Okay, Jack sighed and hurried away to his room. What was the matter with you? I should have pulled my hair out. I should have had that bitch take the keys in the car and put a guard here. And now I'd grit my teeth in frustration. But I'll get you, he promised. Unattainable yet Angie. And furiously clenched his fists as we happily squeezed him. Meanwhile, a pumped up guy in plain clothes, hugging and namesake the same Jenna. Minka, and now let's get on with it. Not calling me so capriciously jutting out her lower lip protested the girl. However, from the persistent caresses of his suitors do not dodge. Come on, stop pretending. Putting someone else's face on yourself. The guy was obviously happy about something. Pericop took the car. It'll be too late for him when he's done. The clothes, too, in garages disperse to us round the hands of all things. Then they are quietly pushing. Oh, you're my precious. He clapped Jenna. With one hand, and the other clutching another cold can of beer. And you and I will be at the Polish border tomorrow. Guys, acquaintances are waiting. 
There's a whole Russian community there you'll like. Honey, I'm still a trucker. You'll be a housewife. He laughed again. How about that? And then you'll have kids, he added. He kisses the girl tenderly. And that big lug of yours, he'll be out in the field looking for whistles. They won't find my truck. They just can't think of it. And if anything, I got brothers everywhere. The guy was already pretty drunk, bragging. That was it. Fate had clearly turned its black side on Jack. Ever since he was forced to sell his gas stations and lost a substantial portion of the selling price of his apartment and his expensive car as well, trouble kept falling on him like peas. Of the skinny great burned out. The most beloved profitable cafe in a good profitable place. The arsonist was never found and blamed it on faulty wiring. But Jack sensed that somehow that nasty slut Jenna was behind the incident. Following this trouble, he had an accident, smashed his favorite car to the ground, and hurt himself badly enough, even though he was not at fault in that accident. The truck driver fell asleep at the wheel and went so far on the oncoming road that he collected a bunch of five cars. However, one of the victims was even less lucky than Jack. It was fatal there and our hero was hospitalized with multiple fractures and bruises. His head, thank God, was not seriously injured and his spine was also oak, but broken ribs, bruised internal organs, and a broken leg. Leg in two places still required a long rehabilitation, finally discharged after a few months. Jack found that his manager had safely fled to an unknown destination with most of his assets, and business was in complete chaos. Profits were almost non-existent. Employees had been fired in droves, and the once profitable business was now in a sorry state. On top of that, creditors emerged like mushrooms after the rain for some unknown debts incurred by the same runaway manager. Soon it became clear that he would have to part with this business. Business partners turned their backs at once and not only did not help his gangster friends, and they even demanded extra for the months of forced downtime. I'm broke, Ross. Let me at least recover a little. Jack tried to talk his way out of it, but nobody gave a damn about his difficulties. You're told to pay, you pay. If you can't, we'll put you on the meter. That was the end of the story. He had to shrink to the max and sell everything. When he settled his debts and mandatory contributions to the Commonwealth, he was left with only a pittance. A total wrecked car after an accident. Yeah, one last apartment. You had to live somewhere, not to whine. Son advised him indifferently some of the older comrades is not the first, and you're not the last. Let's in line to collect coins tadpoles in these positions we always need a hand. You know that. Yes, he was aware, but he never thought he'd have to start all over again. How's that? Jack couldn't even wrap his head around it. He felt insanely sorry for himself and was ready to jump off a bridge. Honestly, he wanted to go and punch someone in the face. Find Jenna the bitch and have her Botox my face. But none of that was possible. Who was going to work for a pauper now? Oh, how sick of it all. In a helpless rage, he clenched his fists and kicked with all his might at some rock that lay at the beginning of the bridge. But it was bigger than it looked. It had grown into the earth long ago and all that was visible on the surface was the tip of a foot almost off a spike. The pain made Jack slightly distracted from his troubles and self-inflicted black innovations. He walked down the street away, wherever his eyes could see him. He walked as if in a kind of trance, until he almost tripped over a small dirty creature in a cubbyhole near a transformer booth in a dusty public garden. Jack took a closer look. It was a child unbelievably dirty, covered in rags of some kind. He couldn't even tell if it was a boy or a girl. It was April, and the nights were still quite cold. Jack overcame his squeamishness and cautiously touched the baby's shoulder. A frightening thought flashed through his mind. Could it be dead? But the child moved and turned his head, looked at the approaching and frightened, flapping his huge eyes behind his back. What are you doing here? Asked Jack. How can you be softer? It's cold. Where are the parents? The baby didn't answer. He just shrank back and pulled his head into his shoulders 
as if he were expecting a blow. No, it doesn't work that way. Jack suddenly decided. He forgot all about his difficulties, and something inside him flipped, as if a burning candle was burning. He felt pity and shame, and somehow he was not ready to analyze his feelings, but simply pinned Nadine off to him. She was already there. He was about to run home. But then came a faint voice, went chick, peace is mine. In response to this cry, someone groaned pitifully, and from the nearest bush crawled out scrawny scrawny cat, skin and bones, and just as cautiously stared at Jask, trailing yellow eyes. Shit, there's two of you. Jack hesitated, both the cat and the baby he could hardly carry on foot. Besides, the cat didn't seem very cooperative. What to do? You know, buddy, we're going to call an animal cab now. Jack suddenly had his own conjecture and decided. He and Jenna had used such a service once before. She had a hankering to get a spitz at the time. They went to get a puppy, but out of inexperience did not take the carriers with them. Takes care, advised to call such a cab. So Jack tried the phone, looking for the right number. And here's the geolocation. Yep, the car would arrive in seven minutes. Not told, pleased with himself, he informed the cat for some reason. He even winked. The kitten, strangely enough, did not run away anywhere, but sat at a respectful distance and watched attentively. What was this strange man doing with his little friend? How on earth did you get yourself into this mess? Jack, in the meantime, was urging the passerby on from here to there and gently cradling his little body the child dozed off helplessly again, with his thin neck hanging down. I could see that he was extremely exhausted and his strength was running out. At last the car arrived. The driver, upon learning exactly who the client was going to transport, he almost wagged his finger at his temple. What are you doing, man? How are you going to lure him into the transfer? Look, it's a sick stray animal too. Is he going to give me some kind of disease or something? No, I didn't sign up for that. And the cabbie was about to leave. But Jack stopped him and shoved a hundred dollar bill firmly in his hand. Friend, I really need help with the cage. But if I have to, the cabbie agreed right away. Only you will catch it yourself afterwards. Jack carefully put the baby on the seat, wrapped it in his jacket, took the carrier, put it near the bush and began to call out. Cat, come. Come here, don't be afraid, I won't hurt you. The cat sat stubbornly in the bushes, nervously beating its tail at its sides, and was not going anywhere. As soon as Jack approached to grab him with his hand, he crawled deeper into his hiding place and thicket, and there was a menacing growl and hiss. The hell with you, angered Jack. In a few minutes, as you know, you can keep disappearing around here. From the open car came the piteous, childlike voice of a fluffy, quiet, hopeless wail again. The cat got alert, raised its ears, stopped hissing, and as a shadow, slipped out of the bush, assessed the situation, and in two seconds, having passed all obstacles in the form of a terrible stranger and a cage, jumped into the car, sat down on the back seat near the human lump, and hissed furiously at the return driver. Like a tiger shook his head, how to ride with him, slowly drive. Told Jack, who still hadn't lost his bossy intonation, he climbed into the front seat. I was careful to fasten my seat belt to the child in front of me. He won't do anything to you. You see, he's guarding his friend. If we get there without incident, you'll get the same amount of money. The emboldened driver shook his head resolutely and drove off. He had driven jerks like that before. Not for the first time. Still, his natural curiosity soon got the better of him. So he asked Jack before he dropped off his strange passengers. And he pointed with a nod at the child. Mine answered Jack in the affirmative. And didn't add another word. Just slipped the cab driver a few more bills. So long. The chief waved him off. Call me if you need me. Jack gently pulled Nadinov out. The cat followed and the three of them disappeared into the entryway of a nice apartment building. Yes, business. Shook his head, the driver carefully folded the proceeds and departed, 
finding himself in the familiar warmth of his comfortable apartment. Jack was suddenly horrified almost as he imagined what his little one had to endure. Find the burden, carefully freeing the child from the rags in the bathtub. The man almost howled in shock. In front of him was a living skeleton, covered in leather. How could such a thing be possible? Jack muttered aloud. The child, who turned out to be a girl, sat quietly, not uttering a word, and only stared somewhere past, hardly able to see with his eyes. Jack managed to wash the baby with warm water and shampoo, wrapped her in a towel, and brought her to V. He went through the closet, found his smallest t-shirt, and somehow fitted it to her skinny body. I put the baby on the couch, moved a chair nearby, so that, God forbid, she would not fall off, covered her with a warm blanket, and went into the kitchen to warm milk in the microwave, made a sandwich with sausage and brought it all to his unexpected guest. Hold it up to your ears. An animal light glittered in the girl's eyes, and she went away almost as much as a cat from the bushes pounced on Jask's food at the sight of this sight. About a hiss of cold sweat fluff called out to the little one, leaving a small bite of sandwich and searching her eyes. The cat still sitting in the hallway, hanging for clothes, was immediately there, and in one fell swoop swallowed his share. You're really something. Jack barely squeezed out, and went to make another portion of food. The cat opened a can of sprats in the kitchen. There was nothing else suitable, and he poured milk into the saucers. Kitty Kitty called out to the animal. I didn't have to say it twice. In less than a minute, both the tin and the saucer were clean to a shine, and the girl swallowed her food again instantly. But she didn't say anything. She just sighed contentedly and threw herself on the pillow with her eyes closed. The cat crawled under the couch and fell silent there. Jack began to think. He needed a doctor. That was understandable. But if he took her to the clinic, they would ask a lot of questions that he didn't have the answers to. And of course, they would take the baby to an orphanage. Then he, Jack, can hardly do anything to help her. What is he? An out-of-work gangster, a bankrupt businessman. He doesn't even have a job history. No child welfare agency would give a child to someone like that. Strangely enough, he didn't ask himself why he wanted a child at all. He just felt a pang of insane pity and a desire to protect him from the world at all costs. This small and helpless creature. Thinking thus, Jack decided to call the doctor who had treated him at the clinic during the last months of his recovery. He answered immediately, not surprised at all and said that he would certainly come to the call. He named an amount. Jack still had some money. Not much, of course. But compared to the same cab driver, he could probably be considered a man of means, smirked mentally at the pun. The guy, while waiting for the doctor, decided to clean up a bit. It had been a long time since he had had to do this sort of thing. But the amazing thing was, now that he had someone to try for, the job was so messy in the hands of the door to the guest bedroom. He covered it so as not to disturb his occasional guests, and he got down to cleaning himself. Then he went to the store near the house and bought the first jars of baby food, milk, loaf, canned food for the cat, some cooked, good sausage and other small things. In the evening, the doctor arrived, saw the patient, whistled a little press. Where did you get her from? Jack said she must be hospitalized. The doctor pronounced the verdict unquestioningly. She is extremely emaciated. Lice God knows what else the child must be examined and parents or guardians must be found. I'm her guardian, Jack, and I'm not going to give her up to anyone. Her parents are probably looking for her. The doctor tried to reason with his recent patient. Is that how it's done? They find a stray on the street and decide to keep it like a cat. It's a human being. She needs both documents and proper custody. Look, doctor, Jack pleaded. Do you see the condition she's in? The custody she has now. Don't you know how things work there? Let her stay with me until she gets better. Maybe later she'll be able to tell me something. The girl looks about four years old. The doctor squinted. She won't say anything. She's in shock now. If she remembered anything at all, she had forgotten everything a long time ago. Let's do this, he sighed. 
Let's take her to the clinic and have her examined. If something serious comes up, there's nothing to be done. We'll have to make a card and draw up all the papers. Call in the specialists from child welfare. And if outpatient care is possible, will you take a nurse for her and nurse her at home? But I warn you right away, it's all solely your responsibility. Of course, of course, Jack assured him. Here you are. Thank you very much. Fortunately, nothing more serious than malnutrition and developmental delays were found in the girl. For the second month, she was at Jack's house, with two nannies on duty at all times. It was as if the boy had grown wings. He wanted the girl to get better so badly that he would do anything, even if he did not go back to unloading wagons in the criminal structure. And since he had no debts and there was no more business, no one was looking for him. Jack looked for a good repair shop and a cheaper one, finally found one, repaired his car there, and got a job as a cab driver. And between shifts, he really went to unload cars on the railroad, tired as hell. But at least I had something to provide for, for money, for treatment and care, and not even getting into his meager by previous standard stocks. Yes, he named the girl Molly and her fortune made a big difference. She got better. She didn't look like a living skeleton anymore. She began to speak and even smile a little bit. The cat, invariably present next to me, also distinguished itself. He grew a new coat, stopped hiding under cupboards and beds, and still guarded his little companion like a good sheepdog. Ali smiled at the little girl when she saw her patron, mangling his name ridiculously. Hello, Molly. Coming home, he brought her sweet buns with raisins, chocolate ice cream, colored pencils, plasticine. How did you manage to go for a walk today? And the girl nodded. We went for a walk with the nanny. We walked for an hour in the morning until it rained, said the nurse. And in the evening we didn't go. It is very wet there. The doctor told me to be careful. I don't want to catch a cold. Isn't that right? Jack approved. We'll have tea and buns now. Yes, Molly. Yes, rejoiced the girl and caught Jack by the arm walked with him to the big and bright kitchen at the table. While the kettle was heating itself, she sat on his lap and purred, purred, like a little kitten rubbing the boy's clothes and hair. Time passed. The doctor increasingly persistently asked what Jack intended to do with his ward. He stipulated, promising that here was another week and we'd think about it, and all in that vein. In fact, he broke out in a cold sweat every time he imagined what would happen if the day were taken away from him. How would he live then? For what in this little girl was now the whole meaning of his existence? A whole world previously unknown had come into focus. In the end, Jack decided on this. It was no longer possible to stay in the city. That was clear as day. A little more and the doctor would help and the kind neighbors would report him to the proper place, and the ruthless officials would take him away for the day. So he had to go somewhere where no one would find them, and no one would ask too many questions. But where to exactly? Where to find such a place? Jack thought long and hard, guessing this way and that. Eh, if only all this had happened before, when he was rich. Then she and Molly would go anywhere in the world, even to the Maldives or the Himalayas. And they would have lived happily ever after, though, thinking along those lines. Jack had somehow discounted the fact that as a formerly rich, indifferent, and calculating man, he would never have thought to trudge around the city on foot, looking at dusty roadside squares. There was only one thing left to take home to his mother for the day. Jack had no doubt at all that she would accept the girl as her own. It was all right that they had not seen each other for nearly 10 years. Never mind that he was a prodigal sheep and the last bastard. His mother is the kindest person in this world. She's sure to take pity on the orphan. There in a village far from the bustling metropolis, no one will be surprised that he brought home a child. We'll say that her mother died and the documents burned and Molly herself in the countryside in the fresh air will be so good. Jask was now more and more reminded of her own childhood. Behind the veil of life away from home, fussy, wasted bread. It seemed fabulously beautiful. 
how happy they were as children as they sat by the heat of the writing stove. On long winter evenings when the adults, having completed countless activities of the day, rested, indulged in simple domestic pleasures, mother would knit. My father was reading newspapers or books, and my grandfather, already quite old, was dozing openly and thoughtfully played in a large rocking chair. My uncle and my father's sister's aunts also came, bringing their husbands and daughters-in-law and their children with them. Noise, clamor, and joyful laughter. And afterwards they sat at the long simple table made of smoothly abstracted boards, all together eating barbecue. Yeah, I can't help but salivate. How we used to run across the courtyard to the bathhouse in boots on bare feet. How we used to decorate the big Christmas tree. And in summer, there was no better time than the hot smell of berries and fresh leather grass. A country summer. The river, the mountains, Svoboda, the sand pit, where you rode down the slopes like an ice slide, sighing clouds of sand, looking for eggs, fish their lizards swimming in a big pond, humming fish at dawn. God, once you start remembering, you can't stop. It's all settled. He and Molly are going home to the country. And there was only one nasty thought dragging at the soul like a beetle on a tree. It wouldn't let it rest. Is his mother still alive? Lots of things. Jack decided defiantly not to take them with him, and not to let them sit on them beforehand, lest he guessed his intentions beforehand. The doctor, who is already frowning more and more every day. Little by little in small pieces, I carried to the car the necessary things that would come in handy on a long trip with a little one. A pack of diapers, wipes, wet supplies of water and food in sold-out packs, a couple of toys so Molly is not bored on the road, some clothes, bought something new, took some of the old stuff away and even bought a second-hand map. I waited till the planned day, sent the nurse to the store, asked him to buy something urgent for the day. I put the cat, which got used to the new master, into the carriage. He left a power of attorney for the apartment in advance with the same realtor. She had never once let him down. She knew and did her job. Well arranged and where. To which card to send the money. He didn't tell her he was leaving for good either. Said he had to go away on business for a while. Here we go, Molly. Jack fixed the little girl's jacket. Now you and I will go to the village to grandmother's house. Very demanding capricious little girl stretched out. Where's a bite? With us with us. Don't worry, it's sitting in the back. Look. He took out a plastic cage and showed her. See our Fluffy is coming to the country with us. And Molly smiled. She likes to ride in the car with them. Jack often took her to the park or the waterfront for a walk. And now the girl decided that they were going on one of those walks. You get some sleep. We're going for a long ride. The guy gently strapped the baby into the baby seat with the harness. Long, but fast, you know. Yes, Molly nodded and smiled dazzlingly. Let's go, Daddy. Let's go, daughter. He looked at Daddy's Molly with emotion, and she had only recently begun to call him, at the instigation of the babysitters. And when Jack heard her call her for the first time, he almost burst into tears. God, he'd tear anyone to shreds for that baby, so he wouldn't tire much for the day. Halfway down the road he stopped to spend the night in a roadside motel. Though he could have driven and driven clear roads to the spot, it was 13 hours, no more. But there was no hurry, so they had a quiet dinner. They walked around the covers, said goodbye. They read a bedtime story about the princess, and Molly went to sleep peacefully by her caring daddy. And the daddy was not a fool, and being afraid of being chased, covered the license plate with a special film. Now they could not be found, even on the cameras, if they were caught. Early in the morning they drove on, and in a few hours they reached the border of Jack's home region. Here began the most familiar land of his small homeland. It seemed as if every tree, every roadside pole, and even the stray dogs lying lazily at the gas stations on the road greeted them in a special way. What is it with me not like old age creeps up with surprise, he thought, and then, laughing to himself, chased away foolish thoughts. What the hell is old age? 
He wasn't yet in his thirties. Next year, he would be. It was getting closer and closer. He and Molly drove up to Jack's home in the village. Home sweet home. How good is it here? How peaceful, no big city noise. No, the perpetual hustle and bustle and smiles and running around. The expanse, the heavenly breadth of the vast fields running away into the distance. Jack opened the windows and the fresh, clear, particularly piercing air of autumn filled the cabin. He sighed greedily at this tart aroma of rotten grass leaves, stored skipping mushrooms and mandar. And he himself did not notice how the road sign with the name of his village already appeared. Molly by pulling him serenely sleeping girl. We're here, we're coming out soon. Wake up, baby. Molly baby muttered, waking up and wiping her eyes with her fist. Molly baby. Yes, yes of course. Baby girl smiled the happy daddy. In the last month his Nadia began to speak better and better. And here I am even correcting my father you are my good one. He parked near the common house, unbuckled the chair, picked up the girl in his arms, and stepped toward the familiar to the painfully familiar gate. His heart clenched in his eyes. Tears came to his eyes. Taking a deep breath, Jack pushed the door with his hand, and the door wouldn't budge. He put it back, his foot already in it, and stood staring dumbly at the wicket for a few seconds. What kind of news was this? For as long as Jack could remember, no one had ever locked a door in the village, much less a street one. Distractedly regretted his eyes, found the button of the bell, neatly covered with a piece of rolled up rubber on top, so as not to get wet from the rain. So that was a novelty, too. Had my mother really brought a bell into the house? I couldn't believe it, but the facts spoke for themselves. With a shrug, Jack pressed the white round button for two, three minutes. Nothing happened. Then he pressed a second time. A couple more minutes passed Daddy to her in a searching tone of voice. Molly, frozen, when do we go to the cabin? We'll go now. Jack promised her, but not so sure anymore. He was just now assessing his options for climbing over the low fence. Climb, however, or go around the house and knock on the back windows from the vegetable gardens. There had been no fences there for centuries, but everyone's vegetable garden was down by the river and potatoes grew freely. What in the world is going on here? Jack grumbled unhappily and was about to really go to the back of the house. But then the front door in the orchard slammed and along the little path along the apple trees a figure, not a mother, moved, a man or something. Who do you want? He looked at Jack cautiously. He asked, stepping closer to me. The guy was confused. Blagovshinsky, anyone? He added. With horror, I realized that not all of his relatives could be alive. But at least someone must be left behind. The man muttered. Distant relatives again. Sort of. Jack agreed. Now the man muttered, but he didn't open the gate. Instead, he turned and walked back to the house. Grandma barked, so much so that Jack shuddered. He was relieved to see she was alive. My mother, through the densely growing apple tree branches on the pathway again loomed. A woman in a simple house dress and galoshes on bare feet came closer smoking chili in an old new coat. Mommy, Jack said quietly. Mommy. The woman froze in place and stretched her neck under her blind eyes. And there is definitely an old hunting dog. What was it that didn't look like, Mommy? Jack stepped forward and leaned over the low wicket and held out his hand to his mother. Mother, it's me. Jack, Jack. The woman moaned pitifully and thinly and staggered back. The boy grasped her forearms tenaciously and with the other hand pressed against her neck. Molly, hold on. Mom, don't fall. It's all right. Jack, Jack. Repeatedly, mother grasped the fence with her hand. Jack, son, open up for us, mom, the boy asked you locked up, locked up. The woman echoed back and then came to her senses. God, what am I doing? I stepped forward awkwardly. She pulled her whole body toward her son and sent him to fumble, rather than to see Jack's baby in his arms. And who is that granddaughter you have brought to you? Molly's son, smiling contentedly, informed her. Oh my God, 
The mother put her hand over her mouth, raised her eyebrows, noisily sucked in air. God, thank you. You waited. Come on, don't cry, mom. What are you? Scared Jack, such a violent motherly reaction. Is it necessary to cry? Are we going to rejoice now? Let's go inside. Mom, Molly's freezing. Yes, yes, yes. Mother's got it all figured out. Come on, come on, son. Alex cheerfully called from the threshold. They were barely inside. Alex, what's the joy? And Jack came and brought my granddaughter, Molly. Jack came out of the room. The man was staring at the new arrival. Was it you? Alex. In turn, the lad was surprised, recognizing in a strange man his former teacher. He was used to giving a good kicking and hitting right and left and demanding angrily that the boys get wise and do something instead of smoking around the corner. Jack put his clothes down on the floor and his mother immediately began to fuss over them. And if by whispering all kinds of funny words, who's that? There's such a nice, little, lovely one. Whose sweet little girl is that? Is it daddy's? She looked at the strange woman distrustfully. Molly, ready to burst into tears. Fluffy, she called, finally remembering, as always her friend and protector. Daddy, get the fluff. My daughter. Oh yes, fluff Jack squatted in front of the baby. I'll go to the car and be right back. I'll get the fluff. Don't be afraid. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, with tears in her eyes, Molly promised quickly. She asked pitifully. But Jack had already gone out for the transfer to the car. What's that supposed to mean? Alex grumbled grudgingly, barely a door behind the guest. He hadn't set foot in his mother's house for years and now this. That's right. He wants to hang a baby on our necks. Come on, Alex. The woman said, he's my son. Can't he visit his own home? Then Jack came back and the conversation was over. The usual joyful inquiries began. Where, how, what? Who was whistling merrily on the gas stove kettle? All kinds of food appeared on the table, and the cat, released from its cramped cage, immediately crawled under the sofa in his old habit of not trusting anyone. What a cat! The muzzle is wide across itself and unusual color, said Alex. The pedigree would look like a Briton, Jack agreed. But I don't think so. I found him in the park together. He stammered, almost saying it. We went for a walk together with the new girl. We were there with Molly. He corrected himself immediately. She was so attached to him. It's just amazing. And he follows her too, like a guard dog, not anywhere without each other. How sweet are you? Meanwhile, she couldn't get enough of her granddaughter Jack as a mother. How old are you? Four. The girl got used to and imbued with the confidence of the kindly elderly aunt. Four years old, she repeated, and showed the same number of fingers. Oh, what a clever girl. Reinforced new grandmother. Come on, eat, or they'll get cold. I do not want to. The girl stepped. I want a Nesquik. Nana is chocolate balls. That's what she calls them, Jack explained. We have some with us. I'll get them. God, what don't they feed kids in the cities? Alex sighed disapprovingly and sent another shot of clear homemade moonshine into her mouth. Jack refused to drink, and his new cousin did not like it at all either. He made himself a city man, came in a fancy car. Now he's turning his nose up at us. While we were sitting at the table, the mother was telling the dear guest about her family and friends. Cindy's been married eight years, she's got two young boys. You ought to call them in, let them at least stroke you, and you on them. It's been years since we've seen each other. Tomorrow we'll be sure to call them, said Jack yawning. Of course, of course, fussed mother. You should be resting, you know. Molly is already pecking. She looked warmly at the girl, trustingly pecking at the sight of her so big and quite grown-up son. This simple picture reminded her good heart of such unheard of joy that it hurt to breathe. It seemed, she sighed, a little deeper. And this unexpected happiness would crumble away, turn only into ghostly visions, into rainbow dreams. But no. 
The returned son and granddaughter were not a dream. They were sitting here in their native kitchen, perfectly real. And Jack had changed so much since their last meeting before they parted. Who knew he would come home? Only 10 plus years later, thinking like this Adrina was knocking down pillows and making sheets, making beds for her son and granddaughter. Tell me, son, how have you been living all these years? At last, she asked quietly, left alone with him in the cozy warmth of the small bedroom. And where is your mother for the day? She did not come with you, hopefully. Mother is dead. With a deliberately sad sigh, Jack reported. Following the outline plan not long ago, but she barely remembers her anymore. Psychological trauma. Ah, God. The mother crossed herself, lowered her eyes, and muttered a snippet of some quick prayer. Vaughn looked into her son's eyes, searching there for sorrow and pain. She and I weren't even married. He hastened to reassure his mother on his own account. But Molly, I love. She is my own blood, he added, almost angrily, raising his voice as if there was someone at the door who had come to take her away. From his child Jack, the older woman looked at her son with admiration. What have you become? How grown up, how independent you have become. Mom, Jack said, averting his eyes. I owe you an apology. I'm sorry I behaved like a jerk the whole time after Jack died, and all I could think about was myself. Nothing, my son. Quietly his mother said, and came closer and kissed him on the forehead. Nothing. You had a psychological trauma too. They hugged each other and sat for a while in silence and semi-darkness. The rooms were cozy, lit only by a small light. The table lamp, standing beside the bed, opposite, spread its neck serenely. Thin, alive in sleep long ago, Molly slept. How does she look like you? My mother smiled. He came close to the couch and moved the chair, throwing a wool blanket over it. She's going to topple over in her sleep, in his sleep. Tomorrow we'll go to my father's cemetery, Jack said, sinking into a deep sleep. Good night. Good night, son. Mother went out quietly shutting the door. All around there was an almost palpable silence and an incredible peace, unimaginable in the city. Only the twigs of old cherry trees trembled faintly in the autumn wind near the wall of the longhouse. Yes, there was a restless dog somewhere in the alley. Jack reached out, putting his own movement into it. One last effort before falling into a deep sleep. A switch flicked, a dim lamp, and the world immediately plunged into absolute darkness and morning greeted them with such bright and warm sunshine, as if it was still summer outside. My mother, who had already had time for a whole mountain of pies since the early hour, was also shining like the sun. Wake up, my darlings, good morning. She hugged her son and took her granddaughter in her arms. Let's go to breakfast. You are the only one we have been waiting for. And yet, so far you. You are accustomed in the cities, you read drachmas before dinner. You and Alex quietly stepped in, getting up from the chair next to the stove. Come on. Alex cursed his mother. They must be tired from the road. Yesterday Jack, happy with everything at home, forgetting his sweetheart, did not pay much attention to the grumbling of the old man. So what if they got together with his mother? Didn't bother him much either. It was a mundane thing. She wouldn't be the only one to forge one now. And what right did he have to judge and meddle in his own business? The house and the household required a strong man's hand. It's quite obvious. There's a decent bathroom in the house too. Before, there was none at all. And the hot water was turned off. And in general, everywhere you look, you can feel the master's grip. And I, I brought you presents. Jack realized and went back to the car again and brought a big box. This is a robot vacuum cleaner, mom. It will crawl around and clean for you. Really? My mother flashed her arms. They'll think of all sorts of things. And this is for you, Alex. Jack handed the man a beautiful upright box, a 10-year-old Georgian, and added a gift card envelope to a well-known supermarket chain, one of which was in the local district center. Well, for some reason Jack blurted out in a smile, Alex pleased with the gift. You shouldn't have been. 
Yes, you should have. Well, let's go to the cemetery. That's his mother's. At his father's grave, Jack knelt down, folder and stood for a long time, gazing into the glossy. You colored oval on a simple iron monument finally stood up, swung away his jeans, and said turning to his mother, in the spring we'll put a new granite. Son only managed to utter a woman, wiping her eyes with the back of her hand. Are you coming to stay with us for long? Alex asked more good-naturedly at dinner. Last but not least his complacency was affected by the sum he saw on the gift card. It was good money for the countryside. You can buy, for example, a lawn fork or a water pump, make automatic irrigation, so you don't have to walk through towns with a hose, and don't make mud. Yes, there are many things you can buy in the economy needed. It is only necessary to think carefully. We have to think hard, so as not to miss a chance. We'll see. Jack replied evasively, not wanting to give away his intentions just yet. He needed to look around first, to see what was what. He had already seen his sister. After the cemetery, he'd gone to see his mother and Molly, and met her husband. It's okay, the guy from the neighboring village lives there, and has two kids. Everything is good, now they should look for a place to live. They won't stay at their mother's for good. There's a landlord in the house without them. Yes, at first Jack had planned to leave his clothes here and return to the city to take up his old trade. But the more he had grown attached to the girl in the city, the more it became apparent to him that he would not go back to his old way of life. And here in my small motherland, with the proceeds from the sale of the apartment, you can probably buy something decent and still remain to save for a rainy day. And then there will be something to look for. Anxious thoughts about how and on what he and his daughter will live in the village. Here at once left Jack. Isn't he a healthy young man? Can't he find something to do to provide for himself and the baby? Do you remember Nick? Suddenly my mother asked, taking the plates off the table and putting the kettle on. I remember Jack frowned. Nick, his classmate was the son of the same John who killed his father in a fight. That murder was ruled accidental, and the perpetrator got eight years in total. That's how the human life of his own father, a fine, rare man who could still live so many great years of grandchildren to see. And his father, Jack asked his mother, is he back yet? No, she shook her head. Died in the penal colony, I think, of tuberculosis. Jack suddenly felt a pang of joy and relief, as if fate itself had taken hold of a sharp sword. So continued the mother. He's our chairman now. Who's how much? Jack marveled, distracted from his thoughts. Well, yes, she nodded, confirming her words. It's called chairman of the board now. I see. Jack, on reflection, drank his tea, looked out the window. Let's go for a walk, he decided, and collecting the novelty, went out of the gate with it to the former Collective Farm Administration Building. Now it was a short walk to the Administration Building, stopping at every corner to collect beautiful leaves. It took them about 15 minutes to get there. The schedule on the door sign indicated that lunch would be over in about half an hour. Jack pushed the door open. It creaked open. I'd like Nick, he said. The ruddy maiden at the table in the waiting room. He's at lunch, she informed him glancing intently at the stranger. In fact, he probably won't be back today. What is it? The visitor inquired indifferently. There is no work. Nick has different jobs today. The secretary frowned. I see. Jack said goodbye and walked out of the room back into the fresh air. Satisfied with this turnaround, Molly dragged him with redoubled energy, picking up leaves again. He took her home and left her in her grandmother's care and he walked the familiar path to Nick's house, explaining the work of Nick's chairman. It turned out just as Jack had anticipated at home. The chairman was working tirelessly for the common good, surrounding himself with a battery of beer cans. It was never customary to lock the door here, but Nick's house turned out to be locked too. I had to call and wait, and while I was waiting I looked around. His father's old house had been torn down a long time ago, and the wooden fence was crooked too. Instead, a solid two-story mansion of red brick, 
with real skulls had been erected. A few minutes later, an unknown young woman opened the door, pretty, well-groomed with a nice figure. Who's Nick for? I'm a friend of his from school. I'm visiting my hometown for a visit, so I came by for old time's sake. Cheerfully reported, smiling the sincerest smile of Jack. Ah. The woman nodded understandingly. Well, come in then. You are not from around here, are you? Jack asked her as they walked up the neat stone-paved path to the house. Yes, from the shop, she answered as she opened the front door. You go over there to the left, and to the left was a large dining room with a view of the conservatory. At least, that was the name of the large insulated terrace adjoining this part of the mansion. Wow, you look like you've got yourself a pretty good chairman here, smirked Jack, entering the room, where Nick was sitting, sprawled out in a soft low chair and sipping another can of beer. Who are you? How did you get in here? I stared at the guest in bewilderment. Already you do not recognize your classmates. In a fake cheerful smile insulted Jack. You're all so bossy. Jack finally recognized a classmate. Nick hesitated. What are you doing here? He was all alert, not expecting anything from this visit. Especially the good ones. First of all, they parted ten odd years ago, not on a very friendly note. Tragic circumstances contributed to that. Or rather, they used to. In the first years after Jack's departure from his native land, and then they disappeared altogether. He smiled broadly at Jack himself. He had no intention of recalling past grievances now. So many years had passed, and of course the complacency, attitude, and peacefulness in which Jack found himself was in no way personally to blame for what had happened. Since his return home, it still hasn't left him. What was going on here now? It was still necessary to understand, to get into the situation, so to speak, and that was the purpose for which he had come to see Nick. After all, that man was in charge now. That was a good place to start. How are you doing? I see you're doing all right. Jack didn't wait for an invitation and took a seat in a nearby chair at the low table. I can't complain, smirked the host. Here's to my meeting. He held out his mailbox and a beer can, but changed his mind. He got up and got a large bottle of stronger liquor. This would be better. We drank, talked about this and that. We reminisced about the old days. Nick looked sure of himself. He was as talkative and happy as before. But his appearance had changed much more. He even looked a little bit swollen. Even his face at under 30 had become unhealthy. Drinking. I realized, Jack, and noted to myself that Nick was in it. He was following in his father's footsteps. He was so drunk in his day, the whole village heard him chase his beloved around the yard for a long time, just like everyone else Jack had seen so far. Nick asked, saying goodbye to his guest. I haven't decided yet. I'll stay for a week, and then we'll see. Well, come to my office when you have time. I'll show you my possessions, Nick winked benignly, pleased that Jack didn't show any animosity. People like you and me have to stick together. After all, he thinks I'm a bandit. It got to Jack as he walked back home and counted himself in that circle. It doesn't add up. In fact, this visit left him with an unpleasant residue. Behind the outwardly Nick's joker with a clear reluctance to talk about serious things, he was hiding something else. What was still to be found out? In the meantime, it was time to think about his own business. In conversation, Jack casually asked his former comrade at what price. Neighborhood houses for sale. There's a thought of buying something for the country house, he said. He laughed and said that this is not the metropolis and nothing good around here sells. Still, he had to buy something. Since he was going to stay in his native land forever, he decided to get in touch with the realtor and try to call her on the phone. The cell phone service turned out to be terrible. Nothing threatened, and the connections, barely stopping, dropped every 15 seconds. What kind of Wi-Fi do you have here? He asked his mother. I can't get cell service at all. You made up Wi-Fi too. She laughed. A good one. It hasn't come to us yet. All we have is the mobile internet. 
and then only once in a while. Everyone who needs something urgent. But the suburbs go. No way. Jack was amazed. They still haven't got normal internet. What a horror. And in neighboring villages there is only in the district center. My mother said with a wave of her hands. We do not suffer. But the young people, of course. Howling, of course. You can't even go to school without it now. Jack shook his head. Well, they don't think about school in the first place. Mother laughed again. So go to the suburbs, son. If there's anything important you need. Yeah, man. Puzzled Jack and thought about it. It turns out that not everything is so smooth in the native land. And then it was as if it hit him. That's what he needs to do. He will open a company and become a local provider. He will set up normal high-speed internet in villages and villages via fiber optics. The money from his apartment should be enough for such a venture. Small business loans are now available through the bank. We went over this more than once. The guy's mood immediately picked up at 12 o'clock. By the standards of the dial, it was all right to stay at his mother's for a while. But he had something to do. And he'd been into that sort of thing since he was a kid. Although he had received no education other than high school, he had an excellent grasp of modern communications. All that remained was to wait until the apartment was sold. In the meantime, he would take care of the registration of the legal entity. It was not the first time for him either. He registered the body like all the others, connected with civilization and official structures. I was in the district center. At dinner, Jack said he had some business there and offered to go with him, to buy something he needed in town, a gift card to use. If you have an idea, what to use it for? Oh, Jack, that would be nice. It's beautiful in a car. Alex's mother was happy to see us. We should go to the social security office and to the doctors. We should make an appointment with this cardiologist. We'll do everything with vigor, Jack promised. Are you going to take your time? Shall we go in a couple of days? Thank you, Alex. I shook his hand. I respect the right approach. Come on, we are not strangers now. Jack smiled. Actually, if you need anything, don't hesitate to tell us. We'll solve everything. At Jack's apartment in the city the morning after his departure, the nurse, the nurse, and the doctor met. Somehow they left. Where to? The doctor asked grudgingly. To rest, or what? Did he think he would be with someone else's child? I don't know. The nurse shrugged his shoulders. I have not been informed. Just wrote me a letter from the landlord saying they would be gone for a while. He asked me to keep an eye on the apartment, and he sent me money for a month in advance. He was kind of on vacation, and then we'll call each other. Well, I called him too, but his phone was unavailable. The doctor was indignant. The girl needs to be properly documented. She needs to do. What kind of approach? What irresponsibility? What kind of irresponsibility? Suddenly the nurse objected to him. Our Jack is a good man. He was a very responsible person, and he never treated me or my partner badly, always polite and courteous. He's very fond of the girl, in spite of the fact that she's a total stranger to him. But how do you know? I think maybe she's no stranger. Maybe he's not telling me something. And she looks just like him. And he calls her daddy. And he loves her for real. Why doesn't he want to do the paperwork? But that's his business. Everybody's got their reasons. Oh, you and your trivial grin, Dr. Koloff, very impolite. It is necessary to check what he is going to do with the child. You see such diarrhea here. What bastards aren't there? But that's a bit far-fetched, isn't it? She's really pissed off. Honest woman. Jack's not a creep or a maniac. I know where you're going with this. You should be ashamed of yourself for saying that. And she began to open the door from the apartment to the entrance. Grumbling unhappily, she let him know that the conversation was over. The doctor was forced to retreat. As a man of responsibility and a good professional, he was tormented by the thought that by entrusting his life to his wealthy patient, he might become an accomplice to some heinous crime. Let us not criticize the honest doctor too much for such thoughts. It is true that he had seen a great deal in his life. He had all sorts of patients, 
and their motives were very different, and their minds were sometimes full of things that made one's hair stand on end. For instance, just now he was watching a girl from a very wealthy family who suffered from a peculiar personality disorder bordering on schizophrenia. It seemed to her, and had been for a long time, that a child had been taken from her, though she had not, and could not have had any child. The girl had been ill for many years and was always under the close supervision of her relatives, either at home or in a clinic for the mentally ill. His doctor had been invited to see her recently, on recommendation, and he had managed in this brief time to be surprised by nothing for a long time. He had heard so much from her. However, to hell with her, with this poor mental patient, the doctor interrupted his own thoughts. There was something else to think about whether or not to report the theft of the child to the police. For one thing, there is every reason to believe that the girl might be harmed in some way. Her so-called guardian left with her in an unknown direction. He did not confirm his rights to the child in any way, and he is not trustworthy either. It is not clear where he works, where he gets the money to live a pretty good life. Probably some gangster, see what kind of card he has. How can you earn money for such a car by doing it honestly? On the other hand, if Jack wanted to hurt the girl, why would he take such care of her? It's hardly a manifestation of a maniacal tendency. The doctor had seen them together more than once. The man treated her as if she were his own daughter, and there was nothing suspicious in his demeanor that a well-read professional eye could see. In the end, our doctor came to this conclusion. He would go to the police and ask if anyone was looking for a child who resembled Nadia by description. If it turns out that they have, then he'll tell them, and let it happen. If not, he wouldn't say anything, and he'll explain that he had to check. A story he told to one of his patients, all the more so because she really did say something like that. At this point the doctor calmed down, went to the diner, drank coffee with some bun and went on with his business. The trip to the district center took place a few days later. My mother had to collect orders from neighbors who knew about such an event, finish some urgent household chores, find the necessary documents for the social security department, and make a referral to the district doctor, who comes to the village only twice a week. And Alex was passionately choosing the new gas boiler. Every now and then, seeking advice from a colleague of two, they opted for a couple of highway models and the guy promised all help from his side to install it on the spot. That would be great, rubbed his hands with a satisfied Alex. Because our old speaker is dying to be installed, it can hardly be bent. And then we will be saved only by the stove. We won't see any hot water at all. Yes, yes, it's a good thing. Jack agreed. We'll take it and see how it works. The manufacturer gives you a two-year warranty. All you have to do is fill out the warranty card. We left early in the morning and did not return until about 9 o'clock, while we were running around the cops. But we did so much useful work, all that was planned, and even more. And presents were brought to all relatives and neighbors, and we bought everything on the list for my sister Jack on the way back to their place in the village. We unloaded boxes of purchases from the trunk and took for the day, which remained at my aunt's. While Daddy and Grandma and the new grandfather were out running errands, they all played so well together, Cindy smiled. Just like you and I did when we were kids, Jack turned the whole house upside down. And your cat caught a big rat. He's a rat catcher, you know. Now the whole village wants to invite him to stay with them. A rat catcher. Very rare. We must get kittens from him. But I don't think that will be the end of it. Smirk Jack settles fat. Long gone on the home matches fluff in the carryover coup. Come on, buddy, you're about to become a star here. Daddy, I was so much fun. Molly reported happily, hugging Jack by the neck. I have two brothers now. That's right. Oh, you are my joy. Jack kissed the girl tenderly on her velvet cheek. Well, let's go home. Not home. Protested the girl stretched out. And to grandmother's. I want to stay at grandma's, so at grandma's we are home. Jack stroked her head. This is our home too. Yes, the girl nodded. Another home is so much better. 
Through the mouths of babes, as they say, Alex began important, and all present laughed amicably. The registration of the new company was over in a week, and it was necessary to go to get the appropriate documents. In the meantime, the apartment was not sold, and there was no money to buy everything they needed. They had to do something. Jack enthusiastically began to work on the household chores. Here to tinker, there to repair. His hands remembered various small things. He'd been taught by his father as a boy. I see your son's come into his own after all. He's just like his father now. Adrina said approvingly. The neighbor came over for a chat. They both sat down to tea and looked out the kitchen window, looking out the next yard into the courtyard. Jack had spent the second hour straightening out a big pile of old days, destroying them on an even trail. Thank you, Evelyn, happily responded Adrina. I'm not happy myself. So many years of disappearing. And now here we are. It's unexpected and so nice. Even more unpleasant, agreed Evelyn. The children are our continuation. Can he stay here forever now? I don't know. He hasn't said anything yet. Adrina shrugged shakily. We haven't asked Alex. And you ask, the neighbor advised. Still you, the mother, should know what the son's intentions. I see he's a serious guy. I guess he didn't like the crooked road. I didn't have to ask. That same day at dinner, Jack told them himself, excited that the apartment was finally for sale and at a good price. He, when he found out, sat down and figured it out that there was enough money. He would not have to take out a loan. Of course, he would still have to see how the business would go and hire workers. But there are resources for the first time. We'll have to stay with you for a while. A little worried. He asked his mother and stepfather. Is that so, Jack? The woman gave a wave of her hands. It's your family home that your father left you. Of course, you and Molly must live here. Where else would you live? What kind of talk? Jack, what is it really? Alex said. I'm sorry, I was a bit upset at first. I was looking at you myself. You know, what rumors were rumored here? But now I see you're a decent guy. So you decided to do business the right way. It'll do people good. Anyway, I approve. I just need to find an office, Jack said thoughtfully. When the family explanations and other manifestations of joy on such an occasion were over, I think I'll go to Nick. I'll ask him for a room in the office for the first time. There's nowhere else. No matter how you look at it, there is no other administrative building in our village. Don't mess with this scoundrel, for God's sake. Suddenly, Alex got more serious. No good will come of it. What's the matter? Jack frowned. Why do you call him that? What else to call him? When he robbed the whole village angrily, answered the stepfather. What do you mean, robbed? Jack was surprised. What kind of a story is that? Tell it to Alex. And he did. He didn't want to drag it out. According to his words, confirmed immediately by his mother, the story was as follows. About eight years ago, when Nick became the new chairman of the joint stock company, it was still a collective farm because it was more familiar that way. It divided large farmland into equal shares of 40 to 60 hectares for each of the former collective farm's employees. You see, it turned out that the law requires it to allocate everyone a department, but the villagers were glad that overnight everyone became a real landowner. They were handed out papers where it was all specified how much was due to whom, depending on the length of service. Alex, for example, got a plot of land in a good place near the forest of 60 hectares. To Jack's mother you are even more for yourself and for the deceased husband. A total of 120. The villagers began to make far-reaching plans. Who was going to sell? Were going to sell their hectares. Especially since there were those who wanted to buy also for good money. Those who are younger or children helped a lot. They were going to establish their farms. But all these plans went to hell. The new chairman gave out plots and invented at once any fees, and the necessary documents were drawn up allegedly the decision of the general meeting. And what kind of meeting has never invited anyone to any meeting? And here it all turned out to be legitimate and began to villagers' papers. 
official paperwork to come by mail with stamps, all as they should, like pay fees and such and such an amount to such and such a date, and where did the money come from? On these dues, went there is discontent complaints, and the answer is one there is a decision of the general meeting. Either pay, or if you cannot, sell your allotment, and not to the side. No, it's a very clever arrangement. You can't go wrong. How is it possible to sell? Only to the collective farm again, the joint stock company, or whatever the hell it was. Well, what to do? So they slowly began to sell for a penny, to be honest, at the cadastral value. One sold, the second sold after him, the third one started to follow. Soon most of the village sold back their hectares, and the actual owner was the chairman of the board. They made up some fake papers. He created another company and bought all these shares for cheap, and the rest, who had not yet sold, he forced them to sell to him through the courts. The bastard. It's like he's the biggest owner now. He's the only one who gets the rest. You can sell. That's how Alex finished his story and sighed irritably. In short, he was mad for good. Only the chairman. Who is he after that? If he is the last rascal. He is, Jack said thoughtfully and frowned. It's not a pretty story. We should discuss all this with a good lawyer. Do you still have the documents of sale and the old ones when the plots were allocated at least a copy? Is there anything left? My mother shrugged her shoulders indifferently. There are in a box. Do you want to see? Yes, I'll certainly look later. Decided Jack when he had some business to attend to. His business took a lot of time and effort. Molly was mainly dealt with in MATI Alex and Jack did not come home until late at night in a state of fatigue to the point of impossibility. But at the same time, he felt a deep satisfaction from the results. Everything was going as it should. It was eventually decided to set up temporary office space in Alex's house, still orphaned, having stood for several years without an owner, when she and Adriana decided to move in together. The choice somehow fell on its own on her dwelling. What woman in her right mind would trade her own comfort and coziness for a disorderly nest for the apple of the bachelor's eye? Such a bachelor was Alex, a retired school labor teacher. Alex, as everyone called him without exception. But Adrena overcame tradition and began to call him by his warm and affectionate name. Alex, thus showing that this man is now tamed at home, taken to the household, and generally her own. She did. This, of course, unknowingly, but it all became clear to everyone. And Happy is still a woman's toy. Some teasing and conversation starters. One nosy neighbor picked up two men. They never left their home village. And both of them are very nice. And on your share, good man Maria. As if she did not notice the irony, Adrina answered the lonely neighbor. And if you need help, just say so. Alex will come and do everything. Aren't you afraid that in front of you, there is a loud burst of laughter? My neighbor's a good looking guy. No, I'm not afraid. She looked calmly into her eyes and answered Adrina. See you soon. She walked down the street, as she was going to do, to the only store in Chaplin. That's how she and Alexei had been living together all these years, without regard for the taunts and caustic remarks of some of the villagers, and now they were fine. My son is back, a support and protection of hope and joy. And his granddaughter brought her with him. Oh, how Adrina loved her with all her heart. She took her in her arms for the first time. The little puny little creature is almost weightless. She really is happy. And there's nothing to deny and anger fate. You, Jack, don't be shy. Set up in my hut. How do you want it? Alex admonished the boy. When did they decide that the company office would be there for the time being? Jack was grateful for the opportunity, and the first thing he did was to tear down the old unsightly fence on the outside. The workers fixed it a little, patched up the roof, painted and tidied it up. It looked quite decent. And inside, of course, had to make repairs close to the modern style. We planted bushes around the perimeter instead of the fence something like a hedge inside a public recreation area. 
benches, flower beds, and even a playground. An unprecedented thing in the village. Jack wanted people to see beauty when they came to him. They knew they were welcome and could provide cultural activities for themselves and their children. In addition, he had the idea to create here in the office of the Internet Club. Following the example of the city Anticafe, who did not have their own computer at home, and in the village and surrounding villages not everyone could afford such a thing. People would come here, get a workplace with internet access for a small fee, and please, work and learn to have fun. Mostly, of course, young people started to come. They watched and downloaded movies and played games. Where else could they do it? But not only for studies, they also looked for materials and downloaded various literature from electronic libraries and even organized virtual excursions to museums and historical sites for the whole class. There was now such an opportunity. And then I opened Jack and computer literacy courses at the Internet Club. And another circle of robotics and modeling invited specialists from the city. They came twice a week, and people came to give the children useful knowledge. Who wouldn't want to? And here you are very close, and there is no need to travel to the distant district center and in the computer club launched a new service. Help in drawing up documents online so that people do not have to coo mothballs in the city, do not spend half a day at least, and could do many useful things remotely. Get a tax deduction, make an appointment with a doctor, apply for a subsidy, put a child on the waiting list for kindergarten, or even apply to the registry office. All this has long been available to residents of cities for the villagers turned out to be a novelty. People soon streamed into the office of the new company in droves. Here, and the recreation area and children's playground came in handy, and a vending machine with drinks, which Jack thoughtfully set up in his place. Gradually, this new place became a kind of attraction. Meetings were arranged here, children came for walks, in the evenings, young people would hang out on the benches, coming from all around the area and the music outside, brought out through the speakers. Jack's house was always on the outskirts, so it did not disturb anybody. In the warmer months, they organized real outdoor discos. In short, such a movement began. What Jack himself did not expect. He even began to think about opening a small cafe. Everything was in favor of it. For the main profile of the company, there were already the first major customers in the poultry, livestock farming combined. The same school in the neighboring village, where Jack had once studied, and several private farms. A brigade of cable boxes and fitters worked tirelessly. Nick the chairman held out to the last man, using the services of a mobile internet provider as before, but seeing how quickly the new company was developing. And most importantly, the quality of this connection gave up, and he came to conclude contracts for himself and for the collective farm. I see you've got a pretty good setup here, too, Nick said in a cheerful tone, paraphrasing the first words Jack had spoken when he had visited him six months ago. Yeah, I can't complain. Jack replied in tune with him, and they both laughed. Jack, of course, remembered well what he had been told about the shenanigans. Relatives but he didn't show it. It was not yet time to deal with the matter. Well, well, so this is how the advanced city people do business. Nick said with a sneering, cheerful tone, walking around Jack's office. Not bad, not bad. And tell me, friend, why didn't you stay in town? If you were doing so well, you wanted to go back home. Away from the hustle and bustle, I answered calmly. Jack, it's good for my daughter too. Doctors recommended fresh air for her. Yeah, fresh air, Nick repeated thoughtfully. Yeah, there's plenty of fresh air around here. That's a good point. He said something else in a similar tone and generally in his old habit of babbling on about nonsense. But Jack suddenly realized that Nick was jealous of him. This discovery, it struck him unpleasantly. He wondered what he lacked, a full house. A job that doesn't beat a man when he's down. He stayed at home every now and then. And in the office, there was only a secretary before the cleaners came in. Thinking about it, Jack realized another thing. 
And if things were going well at the collective farm, Nick would not hang around the village without work and sitting at home. He would not have time for that. Jack pondered and ordered an extract from the registry on the tax website. It was easy enough to do. You only needed to know the company's registration number. He found this number in his mother's land sale documents. What he read in the finished electronic extracts almost didn't surprise him anymore. The closed joint stock company, Zario, was on the verge of bankruptcy. External administration had already been introduced, and now only a miracle could save the collective farm from bankruptcy. Here it was worth digging around to find out what was the reason for such a state of the farm, and who was the initiator and the culprit of this process. Lysa had been sick as long as she could remember. This was never hidden from her. On the contrary, she was even indoctrinated to know exactly how sick she was and how different she was from all other normal people. In her early 20s, she hardly knew the world around her because she spent most of her life behind the walls of her apartment, large and luxurious, but still more like a prison than a normal home or in countless clinics. In one of these clinics, her mother died a long time ago after trying to commit suicide in the same large and luxurious apartment. Her mother, Lissa, an incredible beauty from a good, intelligent, but broke and almost destitute family married an unloved man much older than her at the insistence of her parents. This marriage greatly improved the family's financial affairs, but ruined the poor girl. It was your husband's bedside manner that sent shivers down her spine. The connection with him disgusted her. As a result, she got drunk on sleeping pills one particularly beautiful, rainy and dreary evening and left this world, leaving behind only a few pictures and a young daughter. Lissa was barely eight years old at the time. She well remembered the aggravated sense of what was going on, which only comes to children in a state of stress as a father. A tall, menacing man with thick, rose-colored glasses, arriving home from wherever they had taken her mother in a rage, shaking her, dangling her in the air like a typical doll. You little kitty. You're the one who drove her to it. What are you looking at me for? You're just as crazy as your mother's babysitters and grandmothers, running off from every corner of this huge apartment, screaming in different voices and trying to take the baby away from the frenzied father. It was as if Lissa herself had fallen into a stupor. She understood perfectly well what was going on, but could not say a single word. She just looked at her father in horror, with her already huge eyes wide open, but it was as if the sounds in her had ended. The next day, the doctor said that Lysa was hysterical. I spoke, yelling again to no avail, and the widower, for whom the loss of his wife, and yet in such an embarrassing way, was also a real shock. I said that she was as hysterical as her mother had been, that she should burn in hell forever. And he sobbed violently, dropping his head in his arms and throwing everything he could at the walls. The beautiful wife had been his mad passion. And now this one was orphaned. The man, who had lost his favorite toy, was on his own, without comfort, for some unknown reason. He put all the blame for what happened on his eight-year-old daughter, and she took it at face value. The girl was taken to a psychiatric clinic because she was no longer able to have normal contact with people around her. Since then, Lisa lived her life on medication, somewhere between reality and a wild nightmare. At the age of 17, she was raped by one of the doctors, a young resident struck by the unearthly and alpine beauty of his patient. Lissa grew up very much like her mother, only even thinner, even more graceful was her figure and skin that had not seen the sun for many years. Porcelain, like a Chinese statuette, almost transparent ashtray, her hair and huge half-face, bright blue eyes completed this fantastic image. This beauty could not be spoiled neither by the bruises under her eyes, nor by the rough hospital clothes. It was as if Lysa was above all the earthly, coming and squalor of this world, and it did not affect her in any way. It is unknown whether she realized what had happened to her when a resident blinded by passion dragged her into the little room where the medical supplies lay on the racks and did with her frail cast of body whatever he wanted. Nine months later, she gave birth to a baby, a tiny, weak baby girl who was immediately abandoned by Lisa's 
the guardians. She herself considered incapacitated. She could not decide anything, but somehow she remembered the brief time she saw her child and even breastfed it. Several times she was brought to feed the girl until she was placed in an orphanage. Where? Where's my girl? Where is she? Why was she taken from me? From then on, the poor woman complained to every doctor and nurse she saw. Sometimes they even took her home. Uncles and aunts. Liz's father died long ago, outliving his wife by only a couple of years. He shot himself with his service weapon. Now her guardian was an uncle, her father's brother. He and his wife now lived in a large, luxurious apartment and took care of the only heiress of her wealthy father. According to the will drawn up by her father, Lysa was to receive the entire estate under two conditions. She had to be 21 years old and in good health, and her state of health had to be confirmed by two independent doctors. In the event that she could not, for whatever reason, inherit all movable and immovable property, wherever located and in whatever form it consisted, went to the hospital for the mentally ill where Lysa had once died on her mother's side. What barbarism! More than once the girl's uncle exclaimed, complaining to his wife. What cynicism! How could the memory of our parents have been so desecrated? If he hadn't thought of his only brother and the only normal relative by the way, he would have thought of our honor, the honor of our family. It's a scandal, bequeathing everything to some bad, but expensive. After all, it is possible that the girl will not live to be 21. She's so ill. Then you, as the only heir to your brother, will get all his property, reasoned the wife. How do you not understand? He boils over. That's just it. I won't. This nasty will is designed so that either she or the madhouse can inherit everything. And me. I'm my parents' legitimate son. As much a son as he is, think about it. I'm the only one who can inherit from her. I mean, if she inherits and then dies, yes, please. The property goes to me as her next of kin. And if he dies before the required age or cannot accept the inheritance because of illness, I don't get a dime. The madhouse gets it. Oh, Lord, what's in it for me? Screamed the sufferer and made his hands theatrically to the heavens. Why is fate so unfair to me? Unjust fate, joked to him. And once again, after so many years of effort that he and his wife had made to get Lysa well after such terrible expenses for doctors, medicine, and maintenance of this worthless wench, she also got pregnant and gave birth. What's that supposed to mean? The guardian in the office of the head doctor of the clinic yelled with rage. We trusted you with the most precious thing we have, our baby girl. And one of your employees wanted her, an unheard of, heinous crime. The doctor made as many excuses as he could, but nothing worked. Unfortunately, the unbelievable fact of the patient's pregnancy came to light quite late at such a late stage that it was impossible to get an abortion. In the end, the case was hushed up. The victims were well compensated. Lissa gave birth to a child who, contrary to her guardian's expectations, was born. He survived, even though he was born weak and small. Do you understand what this means? Again, exclaimed clasping his hands and pleasant uncle, turning to his wife. Now this, and he was pointing a thick finger at a small human bundle. This creature is her hair, is it not? Not me at all. Lord. What in heaven's name is going on? My wife was shaking her head. Somehow we must get rid of her, exactly to get rid of her, and immediately her husband assented. They signed the necessary papers and the baby. Liza ended up in a baby house. Some months later the girl was lucky. She was taken into a foster family, where she was already being brought up in not eight, not nine similar orphanages, such children. Three and a half years later, the girl was diagnosed with a serious hereditary disease that required an expensive treatment. And the foster parents couldn't think of anything better to do than just throw the unwanted child out. True, before that they wanted to do something more humane and take the girl back to the orphanage. But they were told that all institutions were now full. 
and they needed to wait a little longer. The parents didn't want to wait for grief. It was uncomfortable. The little girl kept getting her bedclothes dirty, and she was crying loudly and talking quite badly, and it was impossible to understand why she was crying, or just had no time to figure it out. After all, they didn't take children into the family out of love, but for benefits, not for that penny that the state pays all parents. It was not the allowance that the state pays all parents who are raising children under three years old, but the other allowance that we are entitled to. So the little girl ended up on the street, and along with her, oddly enough, from this house went another mauve British cat Michelle, which the girl loved very much and stubbornly called a simple common name Fluff. How many times have I told you, swearing at her? His mother's name is Michelle. Michelle, you stupid fool, and no Fluffy. But why are you hatching to your room? Or how now I'll give in purple my shell, the coo jumped out of the mistress, kicked in the back, and raising a trumpet fluffy tail, stood between her and the girl and hissed tea, with his ears like a little tiger. You beast! The hostess was indignant, and warmed the cat with a mop, and it got hold of her leg, with claws and teeth, and was thrown into the stairway. What a bastard! And he's a thoroughbred. How much money was spent on him? I can't imagine. Now let them go scavenging. A couple of days later the brave little girl, who had dared to bring her pooch back to the garbage dump, found him on a walk. Now the two of them were thrown out together, not caring much about what or how the child would live. Social workers paid a visit to the foster family. About a month after that, one of the children was missing, and before her grandmother was sent to the village, the mother reported. The doctor prescribed fresh air and steamed milk. She will go for a walk there and come back. Where will she go? She's our cat. This kitty, after a month and a half of wandering and picked up in a dusty park Jack and named his Molly. And the cat along with her. Around the same time, Lissa finally turned 21. Needless to say, her guardians did everything possible to get a concilium of two independent doctors who were very well paid, to declare the girl completely healthy. In her new dress and neat hair, she sat in an armchair and smiled, as she was told to do by the chairs after a delicious cookie. And the notary who had been invited home was drawing up the necessary papers. Okay, well, sign right there. Yes, all right. You are now officially the heiress to all of your father's estate, and you have a certificate of inheritance. Congratulations. Continuing to smile a doll-like, strained smile, Lysa carefully accepted from the hands of a stranger, pretty, a yellow leaf, and looked questioningly at her uncle. Like, well, did I do everything right? Yes, I congratulate you. Instead of an answer, my uncle said, and then took the beautiful paper and put it away somewhere. And what shall we do with it now? The wife asked the guardian in a disgruntled manner. As soon as the door closed behind the notary, it is unlikely that she is so impossibly healthy will be taken back to the asylum. Well, anything is possible for money, laughed my uncle, but I have a better idea. What is it? My wife wondered. Come into the kitchen, I'll tell you. And he led his wife away, leaving quiet and harmless Lisa in the company of the television and delicious cookies. At last, there was if not a break in business, then some respite, and Jack was able to attend to outside land matters. He took the papers, went to town, found a lawyer, who had been recommended to him a long time ago, showed the papers. Complete nonsense, the lawyer summarized. He looked over the contracts with his eyes. How could so many people be tricked by such obvious violations at every step? I just cannot believe it. Of course, everywhere buying up land for a trifle, but it's still a trifle for the ordinary people is very tangible. And this is simply robbery. And I think so, agreed Jack. Would you take it upon yourself to expose this swindler? Sure, the lawyer nodded. There's fraud and forgery and the use of one's official position for personal gain. In short, the bouquet is 10 years old, if not more. Fine, it's a deal. Jack decided and left it to the attorneys. All the necessary materials stretched long months of investigation. 
The villagers were pulled out for interrogations one by one and in groups. The collective farm building was sealed. The activity was suspended. Nick the chairman was taken in handcuffs to the pretrial detention facility, where he has been safely for about six months. From time to time, Jack went to town on his own business and met with the bankruptcy trustee on this land. The parallel bankruptcy process had not been canceled. Creditors were just banging on the door of the administration building and calling the phones. What are the debts today? Assets. Jack would ask the trustee, and they'd have long conversations, poring over papers. When the trial of the former chairman was nearing its end, Jack announced to the family that he had a surprise for everyone. It concerns everyone in our village in general, he said at the family table. My father's birthday is coming up. His memorial. I didn't tell you it was our birthday, too. Jack was quiet, surprised by his own unexpected impromptu, and after listening to the joyful exclamations of his family, added on Sunday, I will gather everyone together. There will be a cafe opening at the club. And that very announcement. Surprise. Jack, I'm worried, my mother said pitifully. What kind of surprise? Don't worry, mom. The boy stroked her hand affectionately. The surprise is good. Everything will be fine. On the planned day, the club could barely accommodate all the people who came. First, there was the grand opening of the cafe in a brand new building on a nearby no man's land. Now there was enough place for everyone. You can come to us and just relax and rent a room for a banquet on any occasion, announced Jack, son, and for the wake too. Today is Memorial Day for my father, whom you all knew well. He was a wonderful man of pure soul. I am his son, of course, but I am far from him. However, I want to be worthy of my father's memory. So today I announce to you, dear neighbors, that from this day forward, all of us and I, and every one of you, even you womanizer, we have all become co-owners of a new agricultural production cooperative. It will now replace the old collective farm. Everyone gets back their land allotment, which was so unfairly taken from us. Now the land is shared again. But only this time, we are not employees of the nefarious backs of the chairman or the state, but equal shareholders. What a number. Wow. Really? Did they give the land back? Or did I hear something? Different voices came out. It's true. Here are all the documents. Come and get them one by one, said Jack. My God, what a joy. And who gave us all this? Grandma gave everyone a hard look. Who should we bow to? Obviously, who should we bow to? Alex, who was already in the know, answered her. Of course our Jack was dealing with this problem. He bought the land from the creditors and divided it among them all. He bought the land from the creditors and divided it among them. He didn't forget anyone. The general jubilation, joy, relief of expressions of gratitude and appreciation that followed these events cannot even be described. Satisfied and slightly embarrassed, Jack stood surrounded by his fellow villagers. He accepted congratulations, answered questions, smiled, laughed, and rejoiced with all. Then there was a gala dinner at the expense of the new establishment and dancing. They went home in the early morning, gawking and shielding their tired eyes from the bright light of the nascent dawn with the palm of their hand. A few days later Jack was driving back from his sister's house in the neighboring village. As he drove past the pond, he noticed a small group of people nearby by the river from afar. They looked like strangers to him. An elderly man and woman were standing next to a young, frail girl on old, broken bridges. Jack was about to stop and warn the newcomers that it was dangerous to be here. The logs are all rotten through, and the river has only just cleared after the ice drift. The water is cold and fast. If you fall down, you'll be swept away by the current. And good riddance. No sooner had he turned off the road. When he saw a horrifying picture, the man pushed the girl off the bridge with his own hand, pushing the speed pedal to the limit. Jack raced almost without understanding the road to the shore. The faithful jeep. It roared loudly, scattering greasy mud in all directions. Driving up close to the scene and out of the corner of his eye, noticing the faces of the strange couple, Jack jumped out of the car 
and threw himself into the water without hesitation. Another minute. The icy jets burned like fire in head and pounded. But the girl was still nowhere to be found. Squinting and gaining more air, Jack dove in, opened his eyes underwater, and saw a dark spot rippling very close. He grabbed it, caught either an arm or a leg. It was impossible to make out in the murky water. He pulled it toward him, but it didn't give way. Jack realized that the drowned was hooked on something under the water. He gathered his last strength and made a desperate tug. The fabric cracked and gave way. The heavy, wet body dragged his hands away, but he dived to the surface after all. Fortunately, it wasn't too deep near the shore. Here, if a little farther away had managed to carry or not caught it, baring his teeth, he got out with his terribly heavy burden of water, put the wet, breathless body on the back seat, and began to make artificial respiration. After a minute drowned, took a deep breath with a gasp. The water came out of her lungs, and she breathed on her own. Then Jack started the engine and drove off at breakneck speed, swiftly away from the river bank toward the nearest paramedic station. Hurry up and help. All wet, wearing sneakers and blind clothes with a girl in his arms, he rushed inside. My God! Everyone ran and hustled, bringing alcohol, towels, hot water, something else. Jack sank down on the couch without energy and rested his head. He wanted to sleep badly. Get up. He heard how through sleep he was stripped, wiped, dressed in dry clothes, given alcohol to drink, then something else hot laid him on a hospital bed, and immediately the healer fell into a dreamless sleep. Where? Where is she alive? Waking up, the first thing Jack asked. Alive, alive, lying still. The nurse answered. The doctor will come and take a look at you. They were discharged at the same time. Jack got off with bronchitis, but for some reason he had a broken rib when he hit the water. That happened sometimes, the doctor said, and the girl suffered much more. Bilateral pneumonia, shock, and complete memory loss. She spoke little and only smiled at everyone with a calm, unearthly smile. The perpetrator who threw her into the water. They apprehended him at once. He didn't even try to run away. He himself was shocked to find such a tough rescuer in what seemed to him to be a deserted place. The police identified all three and quickly unraveled the chain of events that had brought them to this area. They hoped to get away with it here. To that end, they rented a house nearby, ostensibly so that she could live outdoors in the spring and summer. The investigator told Jack they thought they would be able to kill her in a place where there was not a soul and then they would say that she had fallen into the water or down a hill into a ravine by herself. But that's not the way the dark sea turned out, Jack said. What kind of scoundrels are they? To kill an innocent man for the sake of money for very big ones, clarified the investigator. Very big. Believe me, that often more often than you think. There are a lot of people who kill for a lot less. Jack came to visit the sick woman when she had already been discharged because she was obviously not able to live on her own. And her relatives turned out to be criminals. The guardianship authorities appointed a temporary state guardian for her, a social worker who came as often as service in a simple farmhouse without many amenities allowed. The rescued girl looked so defenseless and helpless that Jack's heart ached, just like when he found his novelty. He said hello as he entered. The setting was certainly not good. The former guardians had made no effort to find comfortable accommodations. Good afternoon. The girl echoed back and smiled slightly, more with her eyes than her lips, shyly, shyly, and she looked at Jack so trustingly that his insides were all at once overturned. That look, here outside the hospital walls, finally helped him understand who this young woman he had rescued reminded him of. Yes. Undoubtedly, she had exactly the same eyes and the same open gaze as his on the money. But how could it be? Jack was already aware of her story, some of it told by the attending physician and the rest by the social workers. How are you feeling? He asked, more out of politeness than to actually hear the answer. The answer would have told him nothing. Her eyes already said it all. 
and how lonely and homesick she was, and how scared and shivering at night, all alone in a strange house in a strange part of the world. As if realizing she didn't need an answer, she really didn't answer anything, just looked away inside and looked out the window at the fields and crossroads. Only just, looking out with dark knees from under the falling snow blanket, pack up, I'll take you home, Jack suddenly said, not knowing how he did it. He had no intention of picking her up and had not prepared for this turn of events at all. Good, she nodded, as if that's all she'd been waiting for, slowly and tentatively, and gated around the house, put some things in her bag. Let's go. Trustingly, she asked Jack and held out her hand to him, exactly like a child. First, he brought her back to her home, expected to go to the doctor the next day, then to the child welfare office to talk about everything, and then to take her back to the city. Daddy, Daddy flew out to meet them, Molly, and stopped. Surprised and unexpected guests. Who is Daddy? She asked her father, stepping closer and clinging to his hand, half hiding behind him just in case. This is Liza. She's staying with us tonight, and tomorrow I'm taking her home. As he said these words, he turned his gaze to the girl. She stood pale and dazed, and gazed at the new-looking girl's face, as if she had suddenly seen a ghost before her. At last, she spoke in a tone that was too calm and detached. It's a pretty one. I had a little girl, too. And then she was taken away. You had a little girl. Jack wondered. No one had ever told him about such a fact in his biography. He thought she had spent her entire short life in a clinic under house arrest. The attending physician at the hospital in the district center, after looking at her medical history, and then, after talking to the patient herself, for a long time frowned at her pupils, felt her pulse, and beat a hammer for generations, and for five topics, and then he called in a psychiatrist for a consultation. The patient, of course, had spent most of her life with the diagnosis, said the latter also examined Lisa comprehensively, but I don't see any clinical signs of a real mental disorder. It looks more like some kind of long-standing psychological trauma, an incurable shock, plus a prolonged intake of specific medications and a negative environment. Jack, having spoken to Lisa back in the hospital, for his part, didn't find her to look like a lunatic either. Yes, she was completely unfamiliar with real life, and her behavior was strange, and the way she communicated, stilted and inhibited. But when she smiled, happy about something, the girl's face glowed with such warmth and such real live emotions and curiosity lit up her eyes that there was no doubt. She was not crazy at all, just an unfortunate victim of circumstance. At Jack's house, she was surrounded by attention and care. Her mother gave her homemade goodies. Alex brought her a warm vest. He was horrified by her thinness and blueness. Really, as from Buchenwald, he said disapprovingly, shaking his head. What had the girl been reduced to? Molly, having freed herself and made sure that it was a stranger's aunt, no threat to her, brought her to show her her toys. And even the cat came and rubbed his feet and then suddenly jumped on his lap and began to poke him affectionately, which he had never done with strangers in his life. Seal. Lissa smiled admiringly. How nice and fluffy you are. She stroked and looked for his plush coat, from wrenched her hands into it, and the cat patiently tolerated it all. He growled at her, kept silent, and went to sleep with her, although he always slept very sweetly and lay down next to her on a clean bed. And when his mother wanted to throw him away, angrily hissed at her, let him be here. Lisa asked, don't chase him away, please. She's a strange one, son. She said doubtfully to Jack's mother when the guests fell asleep. She has had a very complicated life. Mother answered her son and told her the whole story. Lord, and how the earth carries such heroes. The mother was cross when he finished his story. What was she going to do now, alone, without her family, without support? Someone will hurt her again, with that kind of money. There'll be plenty of hunters. That's what I think, Jack sighed. We'd better help her somehow. But how? 
Maybe she could stay with us for a while. Adrina suddenly suggested. I would teach her everything. How to live, how to talk to people, how to manage the household little by little, of course. Are you serious? Jack asked, looking intently at his mother. Of course, she nodded. It's too bad about the girl. You can't leave people in this kind of trouble. I think, son, that it was fate that brought her to us. And you did not save her from the water by accident. It's God's work. All right, mom. He kissed his mother on the forehead. You are the best. For tomorrow, Lysa was told that she could stay with them as long as she wanted. No one would force her to stay. And they won't take any money for her stay. You look to me like you're my own daughter. That's how I feel. That's the whole story. Adrina told her. Lysa looked intently at the woman and suddenly ran up to her and hugged her and cried. And Adrina, too, wept. What are you? What are you, daughter? Grandma, why are you crying? Molly came into the kitchen, holding her favorite doll in one hand. Are we in trouble? No, Molly answered her Adrina, wiping away her tears. We have joy sometimes cries too, you know. No, she shook her head. A girl laughs for joy. Let's have a better laugh. And she burst out laughing, showing the strange adults how to rejoice. That morning Jack left for the big city where he himself had lived all these years and where Lysa was trying to survive. He was carrying with him an official request from the guardianship authorities so that he could meet the head doctor of the clinic where she had been seen and treated for years. Girl, Jack was determined to talk to him and get an abstract of her medical records. He still couldn't get enough of it. The strange resemblance between Lisa and Molly and the girl's words about her baby being taken from her. Of course, the head psychiatrist was in no mood to explain anything to an outsider, but he did issue a statement. It couldn't be helped. Such requests had to be answered. Jack rubbed his chin thoughtfully and frowned. It did state in McKee that almost five years ago, Lysa had given birth to a baby girl, and then the name of the institution to which she was given afterwards. Already almost certain of his previously vague premonitions, he returned home where he was met by three women, an old one, a young one, and a very young one. They were baking apple pie and laughing merrily. We have something to show you, said the mother when she was finished with the dinner and the pie. Look, she took her hands for a day at a time and lifted the hairs on the back of her head and pulled them apart with her fingers. See the large, dark brown, heart-shaped mole flaunting under her long hair. It was Lysa who showed me it was there, my mother told me. She told me her baby had a mole like that. Do you understand anything, Jack? Yes, almost everything now. In turn, he too, shared the information he had received with his mother. Jack Lysa entered the room and called his name for the first time. Isn't it good to have you back? You know, I remembered my daughter. Here she is. The girl pointed to Molly. They won't take her away from me now, will they? And Lysa looked at him with her cornflower eyes of a fairy elf, with such a Molly that he felt, understood suddenly what he should have understood long ago. He would never let her go again, and he would never give her up to anyone. Neither would Molly. Of course he would. Shouldn't you be worried now? Lysa. He touched her hand gently. We're all together now, and we'll be fine. 